My name is Stéphane Gambetta. I work for MIPCOM, the World Entertainment Content Market. And I'm very, uh, very pleased to welcome you all to this first ever session on Destination TV, organized by the World Travel Market, uh, MIPCOM, and Broadcast Magazine. Um, Destination TV is a kind of world we created to highlight this opportunity we see, we believe there is, in bringing those two worlds together, tourist boards and TV production, uh, with the belief that by creating programs with the destination as the central part of a story, uh, it could be a very powerful way to convert uh, mass audiences into tourists. Uh, but of course, this is a long process. Uh, those two worlds need to understand each other, learn how to work together, and this is really the purpose of this first session and the speed networking that will follow the session. Um, so thank you again all to be there for this first ever session. Uh, we have prepared um, a little questionnaire as we value very much your feedback on this first session. So if you could please uh, take a little time to fill in and hand out the, the questionnaire as you leave. And now for the tourist, board, tourist boards that are here that might not know uh, anything about MIPCOM, uh, we have prepared a short clip to introduce uh, our market. So now a little clip. Thank you. <laughs> I think when you create a, what is recognized as the sort of single biggest, most important international television marketplace, it's a very valuable, very rich experience. The time and the place are chosen very carefully because it allows you to explore a lot of themes about women in society. I think that part of the enjoyment of a show like that is the communal uh, talking about it. It is our job to lead, not to follow. Everybody here at MIPCOM, that's our job. That's what the audience looks for. They look for us to show them the way. And now I hand over to Peter White, international editor of Broadcast Magazine, for the panel. Lovely. Thank you. Hello. Good afternoon. As, uh, as you said, my name is Peter White. From, uh, I'm the international editor of Broadcast Magazine. We, uh, we normally cover that event uh, a lot more than we have, uh, have ever come to the world travel market, so it's interesting to, to be here. Um, I'm going to introduce my uh, panelists here, and then we're going to sort of get into how, how they can work with or have worked with and, and will work with, um, as you said, destination TV, tourism boards, and, and, and other, other sources that we'll find here at the world travel market. So on my right, we have Damien Keogh, who's the managing director of Skyworks uh, UK. He's a production company. Then we have Chantelle Ricard. Um, she is the head of programming and branded content at NEC Global. On her right, we have Edwina Thring, who's the managing director of Wild Thring Media. And on the far right, we have Anita Rampel, who is from Visit Flanders. Um, so we'll kick off with Damien. Um, he can tell you a little bit more about uh, what on earth you do and, and why on earth you're here. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Um, so Skyworks is a, an independent um, factual TV producer, and we've been uh, making factual TV programs for many years, uh, very often um, based around destination and, and, and visiting uh, places and, and history and heritage and so on. Um, I've also de decided to call us a destination content creator because that sounds very uh, relevant today, and it is actually what we do. We don't just make shows, we create uh, content, 
our specialism is actually filming from the air, we, but we create content of places that we then repurpose in lots of different ways. Do you want me to yeah, yeah, do no. the whole thing now? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do okay. Um, so I'm going to very quickly just give you an overview by showing uh, three short clips, and I'll talk after each one. So Phil, I believe, is in charge of clips. <laughs> Are you there, Phil? <laughs> Skyworks number one. At 2,420 metres, Orange Peel Gap is over 1,000 metres higher than the UK's Ben Nevis. We made oh. it! <laughs> we have! This is one of the most geologically active places on Earth. We really are the gates to hell. That's <laughs> <laughs> the burning core of the Earth. I've reached the triumphant highlight of my walk, the Bastai, and my very first view of the Bastai Bridge. Oh... OK, thanks. Yeah. So we've made nine series of uh, walking shows. Uh, those were three short excerpts um, for the BBC, uh, mostly with that host who's well known in the UK. She's called Julia Bradbury. She's kind of become uh, the sort of outdoor host uh, for, for this kind of programming. These shows in their very nature, promote the places that she visits. This is not current affairs. This is celebrating landscape and places that you can walk and visit. Um, the trouble, I suppose, in a way, commercially, is that they're for the BBC. So actually, they can't be funded by a destination um, because there would be editorial issues. But that's a very um, specific problem to public service television in, in the UK, I think. And <coughs> the uh, ability now really on most other platforms, for destinations to be involved and actually potentially funding um, and promoting high quality content like that, I think is really there. If you're making that for someone else, if you're making yeah. that for ITV or Sky or, or a broadcaster elsewhere, you could theoretically go to wherever you're planning on taking, Julia, and, and, and see what the opportunities were. That's right, and I think even when you're making it for the BBC, you have a lot to do with the local tourism authorities. It's just not a commercial arrangement. It's a much more a, a support arrangement, so that there are no strings editorially. You've got to you know, observe that um, sort of religiously. But I think that's absolutely right. Um, and I think, obviously, in territories outside the UK, the, the, the blurring of the lines between commercial and editorial has been much looser anyway. So, um, but, but the content, and there's a great demand for this sort of content, um, and we've got other uh, producers here who, who have similar sort of high-quality stuff that really gets viewers wanting to visit these places. I think, that, you know, it's always been there and it's still there. And destinations, I think, now can really get involved, you know, much earlier on and help, help shape that. Um, so that's that bit. So, um, Phil, number two, please. Now, that's the title sequence from a, another television property, so we're still in traditional television. Um, it's called The World From Above. We've made 90 episodes, and we continue to make it. The difference here is that I described this earlier, as well as producing TV as a, as a content creator. We constantly create that aerial, that, that helicopter footage content, and we have a huge amount of it with the world leaders in that. That, uh, that enables us to repackage it up in lots of ways, including for traditional television. And we make that show, and our distributor, uh, who are TVF, who are a very good factual distributor, you'll know them, they distribute that tradi in traditional ways around the world. And um, I just put it in there because it's a, it's a way, I think, where, where destinations, if they can get together with producers who have and own and can control content, that brings their destination to life, there are actually opportunities quite cost-effectively cost effectively, without too much risk to repackage that up and tell stories that help to inspire. So, you know, that hasn't gone down the traditional commissioning route, but because we own so much of that content, we can very cost-effectively make it and we, we actually do it in the traditional way, but we could partner with Destination. And finding new ways to exploit that, essentially. Exactly. And in fact, that brings me on rather nicely to the third clip, which is, which is using it in other ways. So, so the final clip, please, for me.
Lake Champlain acts as the border between Vermont and New York and runs for about 110 miles. Useful information, easy search, and 12 hours of aerial clips of the UK alone, covering well over a thousand points of interest. Get swept away to somewhere fabulous each day. Discover corners of the planet you never knew existed. Place of the day opens up a new world from a new perspective. For about 10 minutes, the rising sun casts a glorious pink glow over the monument. Am I on? This is always a bit that's quite difficult to explain because a lot of this stuff is new and we're experimenting just like everybody else, I think, in the content world. Um, and obviously I'm from the content world, not the destination world, but you know, this is what we're talking about. My colleague Colin, by the way, who I want to put him to put his hand up, he deals with all this in our, in our organization. So actually, if you don't understand a word of what I'm saying, he can explain it beautifully and more succinctly. But those are three examples of products, I'm going to call them products, that we have experimented with, normally with digital partners, although the last one we've done on our own where we're trying to take this content and make it more um, explorable and interactive for the user. So I know this is about television, but television and online are bleeding into one another. And um, just in a nutshell, the first of those was Media Savvy, is, is the idea that you can create a very rich documentary style experience within a map interface, in that case it was New York State, but allows the user using online and mobile to actually explore and go at their own pace. The second one, Savvy, takes it one step further. It's where users um, share places that they love using a combination of the professional footage that we and others here could provide and their content that's very personal. And um, I, I won't go into the, the technicalities, but it merges it rather seamlessly. So that's actually quite viral and social. And then the final one, is our, it's fairly recent for us, it's our, our foray into the world of traditional publishing. So all the, this is my take on it, but all the newspaper groups nowadays have to produce a huge amount of video every day to send out digitally. And um, our, our view is that a destination, for example, could get behind a collection of place of the day. It's not a, a particularly catchy name, but it's obvious what it is. A collection of hundreds of inspiring place of the day, short form videos, that make people want to visit these places and find out more. And of course, you can put in there you know, transactional stuff like hotels, flights, et cetera. They might want to sponsor that kind of content being sent out by the Guardian Media Group, the New York Times, the Telegraph. It depends what the brand is to their subscribers every single day. People like to watch it. It's short, it's bite-sized, it's inspiring. And you know, there's a way of destinations, I think, getting behind that. And so there could be a sort of triangle there that works very well. And in that digital world, those commercial opportunities are a little bit easier or, or, or it, we haven't sort of figured them all out yet. So you can kind of be flexible. And you can try things. I mean, there, you know, we, we know that the, Chantal will probably talk about this as well, that the world of commission TV is actually quite complicated. And then, you know, you've got non commission TV and acquisitions. It, you know, if you're not in it, it feels daunting and you need to be partnered up. You can break new ground in, in, I mean, that's the strength. You can break new ground in the, in the online world, I mean, digital world, whatever you want to call it. On the other hand, sometimes people shy away from it because the models are not proven. So I, I think that's a little bit ahead of, the, ahead of time, but you know, th this is where we're going. And I think direct, using the rich content and the professional content that TV traditionally has, has, uh, has given us in new ways where you have a direct relationship with your audience is obviously the way forward, I think. Yeah, and, and Chantel, <clears throat> as Damien says, that you're in that world of, of trying to find out what that new, that new balance is. Can you tell us a little yeah. bit about what you're doing at, at MEC Global in that respect? Um, for those that don't know, MEC is a media agency. It's part of uh, Group M and WPP, which is the world's largest advertising and marketing group and we buy about a third of the world's advertising, uh, which gives us a great perspective as to what is working out there in terms of uh, content, but people getting across their marketing messages in every way. So my role there is to sit between the brand and if it's television, the commissioner. And I see myself as a translator from the marketing speak into broadcast speak. My personal background is I was a producer and director at ITV <coughs> for 12 years and I was a commissioner at the BBC for six. And I made entertainment programming and factual programming and there was a lot of travel content in that. And we increasingly worked with brands to help us fund the programming that we wanted to put out there. 
yes, the UK is difficult um, in terms of the placement of either a destination or an airline, but product placement is now allowed. We've, um, the regulations were changed across Europe three and a half years ago, so it makes it much easier for brands mm -hmm. to be legally in that product placement space on television. I also work a lot in online. Um, online is a big deal. I think uh, by next year, we will, there will be as much money spent in online advertising as in television advertising. And content marketing is a really big deal these days. Mm -hmm. um, people now suggest that at least 20% of digital advertising spend will be spent on content marketing. So it's something that, that brands, particularly here, destination, airlines, um, locations, can't avoid. It's a perfect thing for everybody to be doing in this space, because what is better than having visual representation of the wonderful places that you have to offer? So I'm a translator. I've got a few clips that we'll talk about as mm -hmm. the conversation moves along, but that's basically where I'm coming from. And, the and you've worked with some specific brands in, in this world, in, this, in yeah. the travel field, whether that's um, airlines or, or hotel Indeed. brands. Can you talk a little bit about how that works? And, yeah, and how that so we look after together? Marriott globally. It's one of our brands. I mean, Marriott are a case in point. Marriott have just opened a content studio. Now, that's a really big deal. They are absolutely putting their money where their mouth is. They have brought in really proper grown-up creators from the world of television and digital. Uh, and they've put together a brand new studio unit that was announced only a few weeks ago. I think that's going to be incredibly exciting for Marriott Hotels. Um, Star Alliance is a client of ours. Mm -hmm. Uh, Star Alliance, as I'm sure you will all know, is an airline group that has about 30 partner airlines. Um, again, I've made lovely pieces of content for them with UNESCO. I mean, one of the things that Star Alliance members do is they give away free seats to UNESCO workers. So what could be nicer than to make lovely films about those UNESCO workers going around the world to wonderful destinations and telling that story that brings the Star Alliance brand to life? So yeah, I've got a bit of experience in the area and it's growing and it's exciting and vibrant. As a translator, you obviously, as you say there, you're in the middle of, of those two conversations. What is the, there's obviously some, the money is nice for, for the producers and the broadcasters mm -hmm. in terms of they um, don't have to pay as much or that you yep. know, they, they can get that. Uh, what, what are the pros and cons for, for both sides? Of, of this relationship? There are lots of plus points, and I'm sure as we look at the clips, you will all see that they're great examples of, of stuff that is absolutely working and we can all uh, take our hats off to. Um, the downside is that uh, some of it, particularly television, can take a long time. Mm -hmm. The production process is not short. You can't conflate very much mm -hmm. um, for television. It needs to be thought, thoughtful, it needs to be considered, and it needs to be beautiful. Mm -hmm. And those are corners that you shouldn't really cut, to be honest. Um, digital is very different. So one of, the, one of the clips that we'll look at later on is from Turkish Airlines, but that's actually generated and created by YouTubers. That's where you can be much more fleet of foot. You can be absolutely faster off the mark. Do you want to play that now? And we yeah, can get, a, get an idea of the... Uh, Phil, if you don't mind, the Turkish Airlines clip. Um, if you could play that. Thank you. Go! That's 
just an instant clip of what is to come. This is brand new. It hasn't yet gone out there. I think it's going to be really fantastic when it comes along. What um, Turkish Airlines are doing is trying to, to get everybody to see how many destinations they go to around the world. Mm -hmm. That's quite clear. It's quite simple. It's aimed at a younger audience. So which they partnered is, with, with some YouTube producers yeah. to, to put that together. So Wrightster, who are a very mm -hmm. hip, edgy, um, multi-channel network, have created that for them. And I think it's going to be absolutely fantastic. But of course, what they're using is all that um, uh, instant fame that the YouTubers can give them. Mm -hmm. uh, some of those guys, you know, the, 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 um, the, the free jumping guy, I mean, they've got two and a half million subscribers, or he particularly has. Yeah. So they're bringing lots and lots of other people to the, uh, to, into that content, and it's fantastic. Wonderful. Um, <clears throat> Edwina, you've got a, a little bit of experience in this since you set up uh, Wild Thring Media. Can you tell us a little bit about your, uh, your experience in this world? So um, I set up Wild Thring Media two years ago, and prior to that I was working for National Geographic Television. Um, my core business is financing TV shows, uh, working with international broadcasters around the world, putting partnerships together um, that fund series and, and allow them to be produced. Uh, generally, I've been working with, bud uh, with broadcasters, but budgets for international broadcasters are getting tighter and tighter, so producers are beginning to have to be very creative um, about how they fund programs uh, as the budgets shrink uh, in the international world. So um, one particular series I wanted to talk about, which I'm working on at the moment, which is called uh, Chasing the Sun. Uh, it is a travel series um, where the protagonist, who's actually in the audience here, Stephen Friedman, um, we'll be traveling around the world <coughs> to destinations where the, it's, the sun is shining continuously. Um, we um, will be working with tourist boards in particular to help put the financing together for the show because we don't have a huge budget like the likes of um, the BBC and, and big global advertising companies. So, you know, we're a small we're a small. Where did that outfit. project start? Where, 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 where was um, it conceived? Stephen did a series called The Blueprint. Um, which he put together, which was in Africa. And again, he worked with all the tourist boards um, throughout Africa to put it together. And um, they've been absolutely exceptional. And I'll go through after we've shown the clip of the kind of ways you can work with the tourist boards and how they can support your program budget um, when you're a small producer. Do you want to show that now? <clears throat> yeah. Chasing the great. sun. Searching for that turning point where happiness becomes forever and all darkness, everything that drags you down, disappears into the distance is a point reached by some, but not many. Thinking about my happiness, where I need to be and what I need to do to be happy. I see movement, I see nature, I see exploration, I see an eternal sun. My name is Steve Friedman and I see myself chasing the sun.
so what's the next stage after putting that together? How do you, how do you actually, um, from conception to, uh -huh. through to funding? Well, um, part of the funding strategy is obviously to meet up with international broadcasters. So we're currently in discussions with a number of broadcasters. Travel Channel International, which has a massive footpack, footprint globally. And then individual broadcasters in individual territories, such as Fox in South Africa, where Stephen's previous series went, uh, Fox in Spain and France. So we're having those discussions. It's important when you go to the tourist boards that they know that um, you are well placed to be able to, with the international broadcasters. Because obviously, the more territories you go into, the bigger um, spread it is for the tourist boards. So. Do you see the tourist boards after you've seen the broadcasters or vice versa? It's probably, we've been doing it at the same time because um, we need to move quickly on the series. So um, because we're in touch with Fox, that's, that's um, a great partner to have on board and we just have to make a decision with which broadcast we go with. Travel Channel has a bigger global footprint so often that works better for tourist boards because they're, they're, whatever they're trying to promote has been seen around the world. And, and you can then, depending on how many countries he goes to, you can sort of piecemeal the, the different agencies mm -hmm. to help, help you pay for yeah. it. Yeah, so and what the um, tourist boards can offer for a series like this, um, and for our previous series, The Blueprint, is actually very important and quite incredible for a, for a smaller, smaller company. So um, they often, some tourist boards have cash available, but probably in the bigger territories like Florida, for example, can offer up to $50,000 um, to producers, certain caveats, of course, if, if you film in Florida. Um, but the tourist boards are absolutely brilliant in hand-holding the producers. Um, they can offer vital services. I mean, it's very complicated when you're traveling around the world with huge amounts of camera equipment, you know, personnel and all that kind of stuff to get it into the country. So for, for start off with, you have to get into the country and the tourist boards are um, very good at helping you get all the visas set up for your whole crew, your whole team you know, which takes time, money, effort. Um, they're also fantastic with your camera equipment. It's very difficult to get camera equipment into certain countries. You know, we're talking when Stephen did uh, his filming in Africa, you know, we had some problems in Egypt where, you know, some of the equipment got impounded. So you have to have the right paperwork and um, the tourist boards are excellent at hand holding and helping you getting the right paperwork for, for the equipment that you're trying to get through the com uh, countries where you're gonna film. And often they will send someone to the airport to help you through customs it's and take, take you through. And it's more than just money, essentially. It's, it's the access and, yeah. and other things. Yeah. Um, and sometimes when uh, you're doing your trip, uh, they will accompany you on the whole trip. So Rwanda is a classic example where Stephen went, where actually they, they financed everything. They accompanied him on the whole trip, and it was an absolutely amazing experience. And, an amazing company and by the uh, country, sorry, and they have the most amazing internet set up in Rwanda, better than anywhere else in the world. So, if you want to go to Rwanda, your iPhone will still work. Um, permits for filming. Um, some countries have very strict requirements. Um, it's a labyrinth trying to sort of find out who the people are that you should contact to get your permits to film there. And again, the tourist board will often put you in touch with the permit office um, and help you get your permits. Uh, hotels, which for us and for this series is, um, you know, key to the budget and flights and all those very expensive things, um, they can often help with. What happens is you often agree a budget with the tourist board. Um, you find the hotels that you're going to stay in those particular countries, and then they re they will refund you on um, the cost of the hotel. So again, that's a massive part of the budget because those costs can really really add up. Um, vehicles, guides. Um, and airlines as well. The tourist boards are actually very connected to the airlines, mainly the national airlines. So um, a classic example of that was recently Steve and I were in the Sri Lankan um, tourist board. It's actually the embassy in London. Um, and the national, the head of the national airline walked in. So it gave us a fantastic opportunity to talk about would they like to sponsor the flights? Because mm. Malaysia was one of the, uh, Sri Lanka, sorry, Sri Lanka was one of the destinations um, on our, our list. So again, that's a massive, great big cost if they can help with it. Yeah. So there's sort of many different ways in, in the service side that the tourist boards can really help and, and really help you with your budget. 
Anita, you're wonderful at getting people into, into countries and access and, and, and paying some money by the sounds of it. Is that all sound uh, yes. similar to what you do in, in Flanders? Yes, certainly. Uh, touching on um, um, what Wiener said, as a tourist office, and if everyone doesn't know where Flanders are, is, it's actually Belgium, uh, the northern Dutch-speaking part of Belgium. So most of us have probably heard of Bruges, Antwerp, Ghent, uh, but we also cover smaller places like Leuven and Mechelen. Um, there are lots of attractive uh, financial benefits uh, for film producers and TV companies to come to Belgium for filming. Um, there's a three-tier um, uh, funding or help system. We've got the Belgian tax shelter for filming, mm -hmm. which offers a lot of investment. Um, <coughs> as long as you've invested in a Belgian company, um, they will give you um, tax incentives for that. But there are two other tiers. Um, one tier is the, audio vi uh, the Flanders Audio Visual Fund, uh, which will fund and help um, uh, help your filming, but also as long as you invest in Flemish companies, that's not a problem, and they will help you. And there's also Screen Flanders. They also have a fund who are happy to help out. In the recent uh, years, we've had uh, the BBC come out to do a couple of series. Uh, you've probably heard of the White Queen, um, the series about the, White, uh, the, the War of the Roses, and uh, Parade's End, mm -hmm. uh, which recently was filmed in Flanders. Um, I have a film uh, made by uh, Screen Flanders. Um, mm -hmm. If Phil would like to put that on, and he can, you can see a little bit about it. Example there, um, there are some fit there's a, on the film was some fit footage of uh, the White Queen, and most people uh, it was supposed to portray the UK or, the, or Britain, mm -hmm. and in actual fact, it was filmed entirely in Flanders. What do you get out of that if people watching the White Queen um, think it's think it's the UK, yes. and um, obviously it's filmed in Flanders? How, how does that help? Help well, you. It's interesting because in that case, the BBC were very good in, with their press office and uh, put out a, a press release about the filming. Mm -hmm. And we helped a number of journalists visit the area in advance of the airing. So we actually got quite a lot of coverage about filming in the various destinations. Mm -hmm. So there were a number there, there were Ypres, uh, 
Ghent, Antwerp, Mechelen. Um, so they so you get the all profile over. of... Yes, and so we actually got some destination features out of it as well. Yeah. Um, in addition to that, the various tourist boards uh, create uh, a tourist map. I have actually one, got one here, but uh, this was in Bruges, but also uh, the White Queen. So there is actually a trail that people right. can actually cover and visit all the destinations. So for Bruges, this was very, very beneficial. They mm. already had in Bruges, of course, um, but uh, it was a great way for people to go and uh, trace the footsteps of actually places that were portrayed in the film. Yeah. What, um, is there rivalry amongst the, the tourism agencies? And, and I suppose you have rivalry further, further south in, uh, in Belgium, let alone other, other places, mm -hmm. for trying to get people to film in, in the country or trying to promote, uh, promote the country? Um, certainly not difficult with Flanders because we have so many beautiful art cities and that goes from the north and the south and sometimes we actually work together and we have uh, film crews that will come over to Bruges um, and they will then go further south and we'll work together mm -hmm. um, helping with film permits. The cities for instance, uh, Bruges and Ghent have film city uh, permit offices. Uh, we'll put them in touch, get the permits, and when it comes to visiting, we'll uh, make sure all the arrangements are made between the two. Um, so certainly no problem with that and no rivalry. No, fair yeah. enough. Is there certain things that you're uh, coming up, I guess, um, given the, the centenary of the, the First World War, might be something that, that do that or other things you mentioned the art so there's certain yes. things that you you are particularly looking for um i generally you will find that the tourist boards and the cities will want to know what the content is so it does have to be something that is uh, going to be beneficial for your destination at the end of the day um recently um, an indian film company have been in bruges and have recently produced a film called pk and that will be very big for the indian market very, very important for us because Indian tourists are very important to us too. So, from all over the world. What don't you want? What, are, what type of content um, aren't you aren't you looking controversial for? Controversial, probably. We, I mean, we have had situations where screen writers have uh, produced a, a script and it it looks very exciting and, in actual fact, is slightly controversial, and it doesn't portray the city in any way. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. I think there is a need to know what the script is about um, and to maybe anything screen. controversial perhaps keeps perhaps you keep away from keep away from uh, yes, the tourist that the board's trying Doesn't for money <laughs> uh, just deny that it was filmed there <laughs> that's the other way to play <laughs> And, and you talk a little bit about drama, we've talked a little bit about factual, so it's not necessarily just one, one type of content. And, and we were talking earlier, there was a story, Chantelle, that you, uh, you pointed out yesterday that uh, um, Air New Zealand was commissioning uh, yeah, a, a well, sitcom. Air New Zealand have commissioned a pilot to be written by one of the writers from The, um, the Thick of It uh, and Spitting Image. And actually, how incredibly exciting. <coughs> but he wrote it on a flight between London and LA. And actually, that was to promote the, the, uh, the route. It's just a really clever, interesting thing to do. Um, content s simply isn't going to go away. But I didn't imagine comedy particularly being, uh, being the type of of content that perhaps Well, comedy can work. Can I show you my second clip? Yeah, please. Comedy works. I defy anybody not to laugh. <laughs> if you don't laugh at this, you haven't got a sense of humour. It certainly makes me want to go to Denmark. Uh, Phil, if you could just play the, the little clip of the Denmark film, that would be... Kan sex redde Danmarks fremtid? Danmark har et problem. Fødselsraten er den laveste i 27 år, og der fødes ikke nok børn til at forsørge den aldrende befolkning. Skiftende regeringer har ikke kunne løse problemet, men der må være en løsning. Her er Emma. Hun er dansker, men selvom hun er født og opvokset i Danmark, er hun undfanget i Paris. Lige deroppe på det der hotelværelse. For 30 år siden tog Emmas forældre en lille sviptur. Hvis vægge kunne tale. Men det viser sig, at Emmas historie ikke er så enestående. 10 procent af alle danske børn er undfanget på en ferie. At rejse og få nye oplevelser, det påvirker parforholdet, fordi de får overskud til at se og opleve hinanden på ny. Det frigør endofiner i hjernen, og så får folk lyst til sex. Det får vi børn af. Faktisk har danskerne 46 procent mere sex på ferier sammenlignet med hverdagen. 
Så for at hjælpe den faldende danske fødselsrate, vi Spis opfordrer alle danskere til at tage på en romantisk storbyferie. Det hjælper selvfølgelig også lidt på vores fremtidige forretning. Men er det ikke motivation nok at gøre det for Danmark, så har vi lavet en lille konkurrence. Book din rejse med vores æggeløsningsrabat. Fyr den af. Bevis du har undfanget barn og vind tre års forbrug af babyudstyr og en børnevenlig ferie. Men hvad nu, hvis du allerede har gjort din pligt? Eller hvis chancerne for en undfangelse ikke er særlig høje, jamen så se på det sådan her. Det handler ikke kun om at vinde. Det handler om at være med. Deltag i konkurrencen. Do it for Danmark. Yeah, good for Denmark. <laughs> um, I love a sense of humor. Um, and, you know, sometimes selling brands can be difficult, but if you do it with a sense of humor, it works. And the idea around the discount, the ovulation discount, I think is just <laughs> hilarious. So, uh, so give, us, uh, give us the background to that. What, they were obviously... Well, actually, um, the, the company, uh, British pronunciation, Spies, I'm afraid my, um, uh, my knowledge of how it's supposed to be pronounced is limited, um, wanted to create noise around city breaks. Mm. And they latched on to a trend that was actually happening in the country. And latching on to trends is a really clever thing to do because you can take something that's already a piece of information that people are talking about and then match your brand against it to help make a bigger story in some way. And that was a very simple way of doing it, but incredibly yeah. useful. You must see, when talking about both sides, whether it's producers uh, coming up with ideas and then seeing how they can fund it, or brands saying, yeah. we'd like to get involved in this world. Uh, what's the sort of mix at the moment for, for you? Is it, is it mainly producers, is it mainly brands, or, or where... Uh, where are these ideas coming from? Well, the starting? ideas are coming from everywhere. I mean, if we look at the last clip, which is a 45-second clip, this is a marriage of Tourism Australia and Emirates, mm -hmm. and it's a clip around a TV programme that has been out on UK TV, food, and food is something that travels really well, no pun intended. So let's just have a look at that, and then I'll Great. just answer your question. I'm John Sorose, and this is my Australia. When I started my apprenticeship, we used to cook big style crabs, crushed up and served with chilies and ginger. Yum. When I get to Sydney, I look up Mike, because he does a great brunch. Fantastic. In Australia, Chinese food is absolutely everywhere. Oh, look at that. Oh, wow. A barbecued chocolate fondant. Oh, yeah. John to Rhodes, Australia. Yes, baby. Starts Monday the 3rd of March. New and exclusive to Good Food. So that was Emirates and Tourism Australia working together. John to Rhodes is pretty easy on the eye, let's face it. Food always looks wonderful. Um, Australia is a magnificent country to film in. And that combination of all of those things worked incredibly well for so UK who, TV. who would have brought that idea who would have come up so with that? So the, the channel themselves were looking for food programming mm -hmm. for John Turode. John Turode wanted to go back to Australia. And what I think was lovely about that, it was his personal journey. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just a travelogue with a presenter who just was a generic TV presenter. Yeah. It was John who actually is an expert in a different life. He's, he is an expert chef, but it was his personal story about going back to people he'd met, influences from, from his food um, genesis, if you like, and that's what made that TV series really good. And in fact, UK TV are a very, very clever broadcaster to work with when it comes to branded propositions, um, especially where travel and tourism is concerned. But you're saying the show had to, had to almost stand on its own as a, as a it concept, it always you can't has just... to stand on its own because you cannot make something for television that only works for a brand. If it doesn't work for the consumer, if it doesn't work for the audience, it doesn't work for anybody. If nobody watches it, it's utterly pointless. All of these partnerships have to be symbiotic. Mm. They can't be parasitic. The minute that one person is trying to get a position over somebody else in that group, yeah. it no longer works. It has to be a perfect blend of what everybody wants. And Do at the, the brands end of the day, understand that? Well, they do, because that's my role as translator. Yeah. I have to make sure that the brands understand that in the television world, the commissioner is king. Mm. And, and we fight for every single set of eyeballs every single time. 
Damien, what do you, what do you well. make of, given as a producer, you must have had those conversations. Where, do you see that relationship changing? Do you see you always coming up against people who want to ruin your ideas? <laughs> yeah, that's even before you leave the office. Um, <laughs> I, I think it, it, you need that um, commissioning role whether it's always going to be called a commissioning editor, whether it's always going to somebody sit in a broadcast uh, sort of ivory tower, I think that is going to change, mm -hmm. inevitably. Um, but if the translation um, is not happening, then yes, it fails. And then there are examples of, of, of one side, particularly brands, I think, getting away with too much and the mm -hmm. consumer spotting it. I mean, the whole debate we've had in the UK over product placement um, you know, and why I think it was shied away from for so long was the feeling that you couldn't do it subtly um, with uh, humanity, with, you know, with, with, on message with the program. It was just, well, it's not true because other people have always managed it. Mm. So I think there's a real reluctance here and we're slightly traditional actually. So the role will always be there, but whether it's, you know, we're very down the line of commission, I mean, you've come from that background as well, you know, com and you were a commissioning editor, so that's why you're saying commissioning editor is king. I mean, vested interest, but you know, it is true. It's that, that there needs to be, you know, somebody who understands um, what the audience want and what they're going to keep coming back for. Um, but d d talk, just wanted to go on to one other sort of area of working with um, broadcaster and tourist boards, and slightly really on what Edwina was saying, is one of the things that we um, have, have done in quite a lot of the states of America, because we filmed a lot of America um, as we filmed the world from the air, but there are states we haven't filmed and we wanted to pick them off one by one. And one of the things we've done is we've gone to the local PBS broadcaster. So, you know, you're, you're getting into a smaller, um, you know, focused broadcaster, but nonetheless a broadcaster. And actually, there's a public service element there as well. And we said to them, wouldn't you like to celebrate your state with a special, you know, um, I'll give the example of we started with South Dakota, so mm -hmm. South Dakota from the air. And they say yes, but they don't have the resources of a Channel 4 or an ITV. Um, and it's expensive what we do. Uh, so what we've done in a few states is, is with their help, we've brought in state tourism because they also have budgets. Mm -hmm. They want that show to be made for obvious reasons. They then want that show to go elsewhere because obviously tourism is about attracting people within Flanders to go to other cities. It's also about attracting people to come to Flanders. So there's a lot of stuff that needs to be done. So they want it to be on air in South Dakota so people travel within the state. They then want that show to be good enough that it sells elsewhere, mm -hmm. which it does, so that people come to the state. They also want access to the material we have very obviously specific material that can be used in you know high-end ad campaigns and mm -hmm. so on so they want the raw material but none of them need to particularly own that process and dominate yeah. everybody's happy to collaborate and the bit that Edwina was talking about is absolutely critical once you have them on board okay we are actually taking money from them but what we're really getting from them is not only permits equipment you know advice help support we actually get from them editorial guidance that they know intimately that we can never know as well as they do. We don't have to go with it, but they give it to us. So yeah. what happens? We end up producing better material. So we could have gone unfunded by them. There are other sources of funding. We've filmed lots of other parts of the world without tourism funding. But what you get when you have tourism on board, the local PBS station helps, is you get much, much more built-in research and knowledge that means that what you come out with for all parties is better mm. footage, more organized, more things set up. You know, you get a flavor of that place that's, that's second to none. So the additional help and support from that on-the-ground knowledge is in absolutely invaluable. If you can get money as well, you, you've yeah. nailed it, haven't you? Is this sort of changed over the last few years? Do you think it was a sort of secret before? you think there was a bit a hidden, you'd have to go and track down the South Dakota tourism office? I think it's still difficult, Is actually, it? because I think um, you, only, you only need to wander around here to see the, the difference in uh, reception that you'll get from different tourism boards. Some tourist boards just don't have money, or not money that they can sign off. And I think when you talk about drama, I'm going to call it drama tourism, which is obviously very important, those brochures, you get the imbruge lot following exactly where they've, they've gone, or the White Queen. You know, that actually, a lot of that funding tends, I'm not saying it works like this in Flanders, but tends to come from something that goes a bit beyond tourism. It's, it's really the competition of attracting big budget drama producers into your country because of the spend. It's actually an, an, an economic thing as much as attracting t tourists. So I think, you know, some people are completely, some tourism boards are brilliant at that. Other tourism boards see the value in the destination programming we're talking about. Some 
are hopelessly behind the times. Mm. And I think, what, what, I mean, even within America, um, what, I, what we've found is that you knock on some doors and you give them the case study and they say, yes, fantastic. And you knock on others and they're not at all receptive to mm. it. The difference is amazing because you expect the world to be quite sort of homogenized in that sense. I think people are learning as we go along. But the value is very, I mean, hopefully today has shown it from such a different sort of set of, uh, sort of examples. But I think the value is, is very, very high if mm. it's got right. Edwina, you mentioned before that, that you were at Nat Geo. Um, do you think broadcasters, from, from taking that, that view of, of the channels, do you think they're becoming more receptive to, to this? Or do you think that, that that's something that maybe they, they weren't particularly interested in a few years ago, but now are becoming more um, so? It depends. It depends how it's shown on the, the network. So you don't overtly go, you know, this is being sponsored and funded hotels, etc. They don't tourist, want to look like they've had board, to take yeah. money elsewhere, yeah, right? Yeah, so as long as it's sort of done in a sort of low-key way, then they're very happy for the budget to be funded through other sources. Yeah. Um, what is interesting, and it, it would be interesting to hear Chantal's view on this, is branding programs, because I rang up a network the other day and said, I have a potential brand who could fund this whole show which they were interested in. Mm -hmm. And their response was, it has to come through their advertisers, um, their advertising spend. So the, the, their team within the network has to sort of bring the brand on board. So it's quite a complicated area, branding it's of programs. Yeah, it's definitely complicated, <coughs> which is why there are people like me in the industry who are trying to you know, find um, a path for the brand that, that uh, works for them. Uh, how, would I, you, how would you navigate that situation? Obviously, WPP is a, is a massive, but say it was one of the other, uh, say the brand was, was a non-WPP brand, mm -hmm. where does, what I'm trying to ask is, is how do you navigate that tricky situation? You have to bring everybody together at the beginning. I mean, it's, I mean that you know, sounds simple, it is simple, and that's actually where you start. Unless you get all the right people at the table from the get-go and you get everybody's buy-in originally, mm -hmm. then it's not going to happen. Too many of these ideas are terrific, but they fall over because you haven't taken people on the, the literal journey, if mm -hmm. you like, of actually um, creating that individual project. And you would always do it in conjunction with the broadcaster because they need to be involved. You can't just create something and then give it to yeah. them. Um, just going back to your, your point about film, uh, I think the Middle East really know their stuff when it comes to attracting film work into mm -hmm. the Middle East. I think we've probably, a lot of us will have seen the Tom Cruise film, the Fast and the Furious films. Those have gone to the Middle East for a reason. And it's, you know, getting that message out there that they are vibrant, interesting, um, fast cities. And How have they managed to do that well or, or, or compared to, to other places? Is it just money? Uh, I think at the moment, well, they, they are, have come basically from a standing start. I mean, mm -hmm. Dubai didn't exist 30 years ago, and it has catapulted itself into the world travel market in a, in a way that no other city on the planet has done. Yeah. Um, they, don't, they don't have a sort of history that holds them back in, the way, in a way. There are no holes barred out there. It's, every idea is as big as they can create it. And that is really exciting. And of course, money helps. Yeah. Let's not kid ourselves. Money absolutely helps, but they seriously know what they're doing. Yeah. Um, we're going to uh, throw to some questions if you guys uh, have any. Um, and, I'll, and I'll ask these guys one, one final one. Uh, Damien, is there a place in the world that you'd like to, where would you like to get your, your next check from? What, uh, which, <laughs> which of these tourism boards would you... Uh... I'd just like to follow Steve around. I mean, his show is, <laughs> is going for the sun. I mean, we're heading into winter now. It's going to be like this till April. Uh, either that or go to Denmark, obviously, on a short weekend break. But, um, or both. Is there any sun in Denmark? Anyway, um, gosh, what a question. I mean, sun uh, indoors. <laughs> that's, that's okay. Yeah, sun bed, let's not go there. Um, okay. Yeah, I think, uh, well, I'm, it's difficult to answer because, um, you know, the vision for us, and it's, you know, we are, we, we're quite sort of unique company in that sense, is, is to sort of film the world from the air. We love that perspective. Uh, we know it doesn't cover all bases. We think it covers a very nice but you base. must have filmed most of the world by now. I'd like to say that, but the world's quite big. We are the biggest in the world. There are lots of places we, we, we want to go. We, we actually haven't done much in Asia. Right. Asia is somewhere that, well, you and I 
once found ourselves in a very you know, unexplored part of China, which is yep. very, very interesting. <laughs> I think Asia is a place that I personally have a real connection with, and I, and I like and try to travel there as much as I can, both mm. you know, with my family and with work. Um, not to the exclusion of other places, but I think it's a very interesting area that is especially some of the more difficult territories to film like China which we've been working on for a long time. Uh, you know, you, you want to bring that to the world and you want to see it yourself. Um, so yeah, I'll say that to say something. Yeah. But, Ed, yeah. Edwina, same question, anywhere in the world that you'd like to, uh, to sort of knock on the door, a similar way of Damien? Um, well, I think Latin America is a destination that uh, I've been to uh, a couple of places in Latin America and they've always been absolutely incredible. So I'd like to extend that reach and travel throughout uh, the territory. Mm. Uh, it's an amazing place. <coughs> Chantelle, where would you uh, like the, the being in the middle, the, the producer coming up to you with an idea that, that takes you or that okay. you can, you can well, get? Well, there is a producer and presenter in this room today who um, I work with um, at UK TV who made a program called Dice Man, which mm -hmm. was a fantastic travel series. Bring back Dice Man. <laughs> and literally, he went everywhere on the roll of a dice. I just love that idea. Yeah. I would love to have the liberty to go, you know, number one is Reykjavik, number two is Rotterdam, number three is um, Rio. <laughs> well, I don't know. But actually throw the dice and yeah. just make it up as I go along. I would love that freedom. Good, good answer. Anita, uh, flip the question slightly. Where, given that, that, that Flanders is your, uh, your place, what, what would you like to bring to Flanders? What, what's, the, what's the next white queen or the next... Oh. next, uh, the next um, I think typically most people, uh, most film producers, concentrate on some of the, the art cities such as um, Ant uh, Ghent and Bruges. It would be nice to see some coverage for some of our other cities. Antwerp is an amazing, eclectic city with um, design, history, culture. So it would be nice to see some diversity in some of the other cities. Rather than just Bruges. Cover. And yeah. Has anyone uh, done the comic strip uh, centre yet? Mm -hmm. I, uh, uh, no, but there's an idea. There you go. There you, go. you can have that one. Um, have we got any questions in, in the audience? Anyone? Uh, here we go, right at the front. <laughs> Hi. Uh, Justin Stevenson. I'm the uh, director of ad sales for uh, global advertising at NBC Universal. Um, the title of the session was about mass audience, or the part, of the part of the title was about mass audiences and what TV can deliver, but there was obviously a lot of the conversation in the initial part of this session was about uh, digital and what, you know, how, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a strong influence or emph um, emphasis on digital um, in a lot of the conversations that we've had. I was wondering, from an international broadcaster's point of view, when we're talking to agencies or tourism boards, you know, how should we balance that? Because Digital solutions obviously uh, deliver advocacy, but then w the, one of the points of the title was the mass audience side of it. I'd be interested to hear the panel's views on that. Chantelle, do you um, want to start with that? Yes, I'll, I'll pick up quickly on that. I mean, the wonderful thing about content, um, which I proselytize about 24-7, is that once you've got a piece of content, you can turn it into seven or eight different things. If you've got a travel show that has cookery at the heart of it, you've got a TV show, you've got short online films, you've got a cookery book, you've got advertorials, you can do augmented reality apps in the place that you go to. That one piece of content literally spreads like a liquid across so many different platforms. And I think that's where broadcasters, obviously looking to their digital future, need to be able to offer um, brands um, and um, uh, advertisers alike uh, every single opportunity of exploding that piece of content into so many different things. I mean, you can shape it, cut it, different lengths, different translations. It's just an incredibly valuable piece of marketing these days to have content. Can, can, I, can yeah. I add to that? Um, as a producer, you don't think about them separately because you need to have uh, multiple uses for your content, um, multiple uh, eyeballs, different ways of, 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 of repurposing it and using it. And so digital, which is such a general word anyway, gets discussed. But 
Although it feels to you like we've mainly talked about digital, I actually think we've hardly talked about digital. I played three clips, and only my third one was about digital. And I, and I said I was going to struggle to explain it, which I thought was a pretty hum <laughs> humble view on digital. Um, you know, the first clip was a BBC show, so it's not highly commercialized, but it's, 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 it's promoting all the places, and it's, on, it, it's in peak on BBC Two, and, and, and uh, the best uh, shows were getting three million viewers, and they get repeated and repeated. For BBC Two, by the way, that's very, very high. So um, my second clip is well from above, which sells to various broadcasters around the world, and, and, and all seven seasons, for example, have gone to Discovery Asia. These are long-form shows that have destination and the promotion of destination at their heart and get a lot of eyeballs around the world. So it, it, it's obviously come over slightly that we, we've talked about um, sort of digital, and there have been some examples, but actually I think you know, all of us you know, are, have really are, have a lot of experience in long-form TV, uh, productions and the power of, 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 of big audiences watching it. Great. Question there? Thank you. Um, Alison Cryer from Antor. Many of our members wonder why and ask me often why. Um, there are no longer any television programs on, on terrestrial TV on holidays and um, destinations. Um, not so many years ago, we had Wish You Were Here, BBC Holiday Programme, The Travel Log. And there's complete dearth of anything to do with holidays or, or pure holiday travel um, programs. So I just wondered why that was, and whether the panel perhaps explain in their minds why, we've, um, why the industry's lost this method of communication with consumers. Thank you. Sure. Uh, can I just add <laughs> that there would definitely be advertising spend to support it. That's the odd thing. No one understands it. And someone was telling me over the weekend that Wish You Were Here closed with 13 million viewers. Good Lord. Thank you. <laughs> um, commissioning editors are kings and queens. And um, those pro this is my opinion. Those programs, I think, began to be deemed as unfashionable. And it's very interesting that you say that, it, that the audience still wanted those programs. And I'm a believer that if the audience want the program, sometimes you have to listen to that. But if you're a big broadcaster um, and you are going in a certain direction, sometimes I'm, you'll know more about this than me having been in that position, but sometimes I think, and it's frustrating for producers, uh, sometimes things get uh, cancelled or certain genres or styles are sort of slowly disappear because there's a bigger picture. And I think that's what happened with that travel program. And I will just say, um, as an independent producer who, who goes to briefings from broadcasters in the UK, since you talked about a predominantly UK production, um, for many years since the demise of shows like Wish You Were Here on Holiday, the broadcasters have been looking and trying, Channel 4 tried a couple of things, they've been looking for the next holiday travel sort of pure holiday travel series that will work and can return in the way that Top Gear got completely reconfigured and it's now a, a, a huge global brand and it, it reinvented the, the car show, for want of a better phrase. The broadcasters are desperate for it. The indie producers have been trying to come up with it and they've even you know, piloted and indeed tried some series and they haven't worked. So I think there's a massive demand for it but the commissioning editors have not managed to find, nor have the producers, something that has resonated. And you're right, there's a big gap there. I, I think that's my feeling about it. I don't know what you think. I mean, I think travel is still massively popular. You know, we all go on holiday, fortunately, which is fantastic. But we do see travel programmes, but they just don't look like right. traditional travel programmes. We see Joanna Lumley on a desert island. We see, um, not Palin any longer, that's, a, a, that's an old reference, but, you know, lots of celebrities going to various places. Those are travel programs. They're just not travel programs in the same sort of constituent parts that they used to be. Also, I think that the whole thing about travel has become personalized. And I think if you want to go to Tobago, you probably go www.tobago.com. And that's where you find your inspiration about how wonderful your holiday in Tobago can be. It's going to be a quicker uh, shortcut to understanding your destination than waiting for wish you were here with the, with, you know, with the special on the Caribbean. But, sorry, I want to add something else. Maybe this brings the questions together. I think this is where the, um, the online digital rich, um, uh, explorable uh, op, uh, sort of ancillary content comes into its own because if you take Joanna Lumley going around the Greek islands, that indeed, or Palin doing Brazil, which is quite recent actually, yes. th those are 
travelogues. Yeah. What they aren't is um, giving you chapter and verse on the on the B&B that you stayed in, how much it costs to fly there in low season and high season. So it feels probably a bit too far away from the transactional bit than Wish You Were Here did. And so therefore I can understand tourism boards saying, God, yeah, I need more Wish You Were Here because they can kind of, they can sign up immediately and, and, and they can transact and, and we'll have people coming. But actually, if Desta, I mean, I don't know, you know, whether this was the case with Joanna Lumley. That was ITV, so it's, it's much easier than, than Palin, who's BBC. But if, you know, the, the Greek tourist board, um, who I believe are present here actually, but were very involved uh, with ITV in terms of that show, and um, perhaps were, were involved financially, you know, I would imagine there could be a whole lot of ancillary information that people are driven to on the micro site that allows them to transact and follow in the footsteps of Joanna Lumley, which is ultimately what those many, many millions of viewers yeah. really, really want to do. So that could be a place where they really sit, sit together. So you get a modern, fresh program that actually gives you all the transaction information that you need. Someone will figure out how to do Wish You Were Here for 2015, won't they? they oh, without a doubt. Uh, yeah. Chantel's got it right <laughs> up. Sleeve, so. Brilliant. Well, guys, um, just want to say thank you very much to our panelists. If you could give them a round of applause. And I think... People are sticking around if you want to grab them afterwards.